Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, both those that are with us here in the building and also those who are joining us online. Uh, we are glad that you're here and uh, we just want to welcome everyone. Um, it's good to see more faces here. It's awesome. Uh, we'll begin by singing How Great Is Our God. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness strives to hide. It trembles at his voice. Jesus, man. 
scripture reading this morning is from Luke. It says, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Let's bow our heads for opening word of prayer. Oh, gracious Lord, we are here to worship you this day under the most set of trying circumstance. But our faith has not wavered. Our focus is firm. And our health, we have learned, is tied to our faith and our hope in you. Lord, we are very grateful to have the ability just to be here with you and worship with you and our family. The scriptures says to keep thyself in angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways and they will bear thee up in their arms lest, all, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. If we focus on the scriptures day by day Isaiah says that thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because thou trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. As always, Father, let all that we do glorify you. And it's in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
religion this morning <clears throat> that Mark will be talking uh, about, um, struggles that we have with doubt. Uh, and so each of our songs had within them an element uh, where we face doubt. Um, and in particular, this next song we're going to sing is Thomas's song. And Thomas, of course, being one of the uh, individuals Mark uh, talks about, and just as our scripture. So we'll sing two verses uh, of Thomas's song as we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. And then we'll sing the last two verses as our invitation song. Jesus, you were all to me. Why did you die on Calvary? I was thinking, uh, Tommy, I remember when I was uh, watching online there, and Tommy had been reading from 1 Corinthians 11 about the, the Lord's Supper, and that has been on my mind here, and I'm just going to read that for us again. I know we read this so many times, but I think it, it, it's okay to be read as many times as we want, you know, uh, to remember this. This is it, one of the great verses in the Bible, uh, 1 Corinthians 11:23. For I received from the Lord what I have also passed on you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is for the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Our Lord and merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day you bless us with. We thank you that we could start to come back together here with our family 
as we remember what Jesus has done for us. Remember that he died on the cross of Calvary, that through him we may have a hope of that eternal life with you. We thank you for that love you show us through him and the love you show us every day and the blessings we have in this world. May we really tra thank, truly thank for what you've given us. In his name we pray. Amen. And that last verse, 26, is for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, and I think about this, this little representation that we have here of Jesus' body and his blood and remembering what he has done for us. You know, we could, we could possibly take this every day and it'd probably be okay to do, you know, to remember Jesus. But, I'm, you know, we, we set this time up to come here on this first day of the week to remember Jesus' resurrection and remember his, uh, his crucifixion. So let's pray again as uh, we take this cup. Heavenly Father, I like this cup of this fruit of the vine that represents Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross. Heavenly Father, also every day, let's remember what he has done for us. Let's always remember your love. And maybe, Heavenly Father, we share that love with and show our love to other people we know around us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in the past year, so much has changed. And you and all remember how we all used to, the men would gather up here in front, and it would be it's almost like an honor. I remember like the first time when I was a kid, I got to serve. I was like, you know, I was a young teenager, and I was like, I think it's maybe the week after I got baptized, they asked me to start serving, you know. <laughs> you know, y'all been through that and stuff like that, and I was like so nervous how exciting it was that I got to serve. And of course, all this has changed. Now we use these little little cups and things. Uh, I just wanted to bring that out, and it's been such, it was, it was such a great honor to do that, I thought. Uh, anyway, now we're going to remember what, what God has blessed us with in the term of our jobs and our money that we have to give back, and you know we've got that box back there if you want to put money in and through our online, online giving. So let me lead us in prayer again, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the monetary blessings you've given us. You've blessed us so many, us with so many different things. Heavenly Father, may we give back in a, a, in a cheer, cheerful manner and always be thankful for what you've blessed us with. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. good morning. Boy, is it good to see you all here. Uh, welcome to those joining us online. We want to uh, welcome you as well. Thank you for um, taking time to be with us and look forward to, again, it seems like I say it every week, to look forward to the time when we're all back together, able to worship. And, uh, but God is good, and we need to remember to count our blessings. Um, Keith, Jennifer, it is so good to see the two of you. Uh, we did pray and pray, and Jennifer especially. It's great to see you without oxygen on today. So, hallelujah. I've got a really nice note from David and Carol Sue Hunter, and I won't take time to read it right now. I will post it out there on the Hall Bulletin Board so you can take some time to read it. But um, they're just kind of giving us update about um, Carol and David and getting their COVID shots and um, they just continue to miss them. They do have a new address. They recently moved, and that will be in the bulletin. I think next week I'll have that for you, Jennifer, to put in. Um, so learned a, a, a joke this past week that I want to 
share with you as we lead into the lesson today. So how can you tell when it's a bad dad joke? Because it's apparent. <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> well, some things are not as apparent as others. Um, and doubt is, I think, one of those areas of life. Some people, you know if they're struggling with doubt, if they're a skeptic, because they're quick to tell you. There are even a category of people called angry skeptics. Um, there are others, however, that can hide their doubt, uh, their questioning, and it kind of lays under the radar, and you might never know. Um, I knew a Bible professor that I studied under that I found out several years later that he had completely walked away from the faith, from God. He turned into an atheist. Never would have known that as I sat underneath studying from him, but he was wrestling with that. Doubt is real, and I think there's a level of doubt that we all experience at some point in time in our lives. And it actually is not necessarily a bad thing. As I'm gonna talk about, in some cases, it's a necessary thing for us to take ownership of our faith. We need to be able to ask tough questions. Um, my mom, if she were here today, she could testify to you that one of my favorite words was why. Why? Um, you know, she'd ask me, you know, Mark, could you go do this? Well, why? Um, you know, I wanted to understand how things worked, how things, and, and Luke is a lot like that. He was a lot like me. He just wants to know everything behind it. How, how does this work? Uh, he'll take things apart. You know, like, son, why did you take that apart? I just want to see how it works. Like, will you put the TV back together, please? Uh, <laughs> would you? Well, not quite that, but uh, I just finished reading back through Job again. Um, on Sunday nights, before we started the Gospel of John, those who are joining us, we went through the entire book of Job, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. First time I've ever done that. And this is a word that commonly comes up in that book. Uh, here is Job, a righteous man. He loved people, he loved his neighbor, he took care of the poor, he took care of his family. He even offered sacrifices for his children just in case they sinned unintentionally. Now you talk about a pro spiritual dad. Um, all accounts, he loved his wife. He, you know, he was involved in his community yet everything was stripped away from him, uh, even his own health. And he is left with, why? God, I don't understand what's happening. Um, and I think that's something that we all, and even Job's wife struggled. We sometimes give her a hard time when she told Job to curse God and die, but give her a break. She lost her children too. It wasn't just Job. So she is aching and questioning um, think about some of the why questions that we have asked, or ones I've definitely heard other people ask, like what is the significance of life? Why did my child have to die? What would have happened if I chose a different life partner, or what if I picked a different career? Um, why am I here? Will this pandemic ever end? <laughs> is the end of the world coming soon? Now, these are all things that I have heard from people this past year. These are some questions that I have wrestled with at times. Why? There are many things we don't have the answer to. And when that occurs, we end up with doubt. The unknown. Wishing we knew. Being confused. Um, again, questioning. This was the case for Glenn Chambers. Uh, Glenn Chambers, on February 15, 1947, boarded an aircraft, it was a DC-4, uh, bound for um, Quito, Ecuador. He was on his first mission trip. It was a mission society called the Voice of the Andes. And right before he took off, he wanted to send a note to his mom. So he ripped a piece of paper out of a magazine, scribbled a note, sealed it, dropped it in the mail before he boarded the flight. He not knowing, nor anyone else on that flight, that it would soon crash near Bogota, Colombia, on one of the highest peaks of that area, killing every single one on board, all 53. 
Now, what was ironic is that the piece of paper that he scribbled that note on was an advertisement with the letters Y emblazoned, emblazoned upon it. And it was almost like a cruel joke to his mother, who is reading this note from her dead son with the, le- the, wor- the word Y. Now, the note was filled with, it was a beautiful written letter, just thanking his mom for pouring her life into his, for the excitement he had about being on mission with God. Um, But it was hard for her to hear those words when this question came. And and honestly, a lot of times, the, the times in life when we deal with doubt the most is after a tragedy or it's after some event that happens to us that that hurts, that cuts to the core of who we are. Uh, The Greek word for doubt carries the idea of uncertainty. Doubt is actually not the absence of faith. It's actually the opportunity for faith to grow in the midst of the uncertainty. Uh, The enemy of faith is not doubt. The enemy of faith is unbelief. So we need to remember that. When we go through periods of doubt, we don't need to get too hard on ourselves. It is a normal human response when uncertainty of life happens. What we don't want to do is go over from the category of doubt into unbelief. Um, So to doubt is to be human. In the pages of the Bible, we find doubters all over the place. I mean, from Genesis all the way through. Uh, Think about David. I've already mentioned Job. You think about Solomon. If you, I don't know if you've read Ecclesiastes lately, okay, but he is searching for the meaning of life and can't find it and all the things of this world. Um, you read about Jeremiah, who wondered why nobody listened to him, <laughs> didn't have one convert. Uh, you read about Moses. Uh, remember that Moses went to Pharaoh Uh, for the very first time and said, God has told me to tell you to let the people go into the wilderness to worship and offer sacrifices. And Pharaoh said, sure, go ahead and go. No, of course not. That's not what happened. Pharaoh said, are you crazy? There's no way I'm letting you go. And then he went and told the slave, the masters over the slaves to make their work even more difficult. Uh, In making bricks, no longer provide straw for them. Let them go out and get their own straw. Let's see if they'll ever come back and ask me to let them go again. The people turned on Moses quickly. They were angry and they came to him. And if you open your Bibles to Exodus chapter five, let me read to you what Moses now says to God. Exodus five, verse 22. Moses returned to the Lord and said, why Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Do you think Moses is dealing with a little bit of doubt? You're supposed to be this great God, the I am, as he revealed himself to him. It doesn't look like things are working too well. That's an experience that a lot of people have. Uh, John the Baptist is another one. Consider his life. Um, John, when he sent disciples to Jesus with a question, now remember where John is at when he sends his disciples. He's in jail. He's in prison, about to be executed uh, by Herod. Um, He, uh, you know, was there when Jesus was baptized. He heard the voice from heaven. Uh, He was the forerunner to Christ. He saw the miracles of Jesus. Yet, as he is in a dark prison cell, he is having some doubts. Was all my preaching for naught? Is this truly the one, the Messiah, who was to come? So he asked, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? This is coming again from the one whom Jesus declared, among those born of women, there's no one greater. So if one of the greatest men to ever live, John the Baptist, had doubts, do you think it's okay if you have doubts? You can go like this, yeah. It is okay. I think it's normal for us 
to go through periods of time when we struggle with doubt. For um, my master's thesis, oh, so many years ago, <laughs> Um, I studied faith development, uh, looked at a couple of experts like Stokes and Fowler and read a bunch of books. And it talked about the stages or styles of faith, almost like styles of faith better than stages because with a stage you think you have to move progressively from one to another. Faith doesn't always work that way. Sometimes it kind of moves around. Uh, but one of the things one of the steps of faith is to go through a time of questioning. And that's where faith becomes your own. For some people, they, all they have is an inherited faith. That's where you were born into a faith community and you just took on that faith. You know, consider all the religions out there in the world. If you grow up maybe in India, you would assume maybe you might be Hindu uh, or Muslim. Uh, Middle East, you might very well be Muslim. Uh, here in America, there's a wide you know, diversity, but likely Christian. So the danger of having an inherited faith is that it never became your own. You're just only doing faith because that's what you saw your parents do or a family member. Um, an associated faith is a faith where it's, it's more than inherited. It's your community of people who are around you. Now, I experienced both of those types of faith. My parents introduced me to Jesus. You know, I followed Christ because they were followers of Christ. It became more than that as I got older because I had friends who were Christians. I had family within our church uh, that loved me. But there came a point in time when I had to take my own faith. And I had to ask, is this real? So I began to study other religions, the world religions that are out there to look to see, is there any truth in those? And, you know, some might say, Mark, why did you do that? But I needed to do that. And it allowed me to see Christianity from a different light, that I believe this. I believe that Jesus Christ is real. And he walked this earth. And he was raised from the dead. And I thus have my own faith. Does that make sense? Uh, I think it's important for us because when the troubles of life come, when the doubts come, if we've not inherit, taken our own faith on, it can, be, it can be touchy. It can be a little scary. Um, we have another famous doubter in Scripture. His name is Thomas. Um, Thomas is a, um, also has the word Thomas Didymus. Some people think that must mean doubter. Doubting Thomas is, is that how you grew up probably hearing about him. That wasn't his name. A Didymus actually means twin. Thomas was a twin. In fact, the English word ditto, double, comes from Didymus. Now, we don't know anything about his twin in Scripture, but we do know that there were times when Thomas had a double mind. There's times when it appeared that his faith was very strong, and there were times that it appeared to be a little bit weak, where he doubted, thus the name. There's a number of places in Scripture we can read about Thomas, but I want to take your attention, turn your attention to John chapter 14. It's here where Jesus has just told his disciples, it's after, at the Last Supper, and it's a section of teaching in John, where Jesus talks about he's going to prepare a place for them, and he will come back to take them to be with him. And Thomas, I love him because he is not afraid to speak up when everybody else is silent. He just opens his mouth and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? He's just being honest. Um, earlier, back in chapter 11 of John, Thomas is not happy about Jesus deciding to go to uh, Bethany where Lazarus died um, because he knows that Jesus is a wanted man. This is near the end of Jesus' three years of ministry, and the, the officials are wanting to kill him. And Thomas basically is like, I don't think you should go. Nobody else listens. So he's like, well, let's just go ahead and we'll all die with you. <laughs> that was Thomas's approach. Um, so uh, a big moment now is coming in Thomas's life in John chapter 20. Let's observe some truths. 
uh, some lessons we can learn from, jo uh, from John's gospel about how to deal with doubt. Point number one, doubt thrives in isolation. Now it is resurrection day. Jesus has appeared behind closed doors to his apostles. 10 of them are there. Judas, of course, has already taken his life, but who's the one missing? Thomas. Thomas is not there. I've wondered, why isn't he there? All the rest of them are. Is he at home in isolation? Maybe his doubts are starting to overcome him. Uh, it didn't work out the way I thought it was going to work out. I, I don't know. But now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. When somebody dies, their culture isn't any different from ours. Typically, we want to surround the person who has lost a loved one. We'll bring food to their house. You know, sometimes we'll eat together, we'll fellowship together. A lot of times, as you know here at Arlington, that we'll have a, a meal up in the fellowship hall uh, after the celebration of the person's life. And, and while the conversation at times might be kind of low, the voices might be low, there's, there's also some spontaneous laughter that breaks out is a story is shared about something that person did, something that person said. And I can imagine maybe some of that is happening now for the disciples. They're meeting together, they're comforting each other, but Thomas is nowhere to be found. Um, doubt loves to stay isolated. If it will thrive in the recesses of the human heart, in solitude, questions become much bigger than what they actually are. It becomes more hopeless. Again, I take you back to John the Baptist. Where was he when his doubt arise? He's in isolation. He's in a prison cell. Thomas is in isolation. He's away from the others. And doubt stirs. You know, sometimes our questions have less to do with theological struggles than with a case of the blues. Anybody in here ever had a case of the blues? All right. All of us, if we're honest. And when you go through those moments, it can cause you to start thinking about things and pondering things and doubts beginning to arise. Um, the fatigue, it can actually cause what's, cause what's called soul fatigue. C.S. Lewis wrote about struggling with doubt at times when he was traveling. You can imagine how much C.S. Lewis traveled, being a speaker and a writer. And when he was away from home, staying at these different inns, um, he s struggled with what he calls a fit of soul vertigo. <laughs> soul vertigo. I like that. Danny, you know what vertigo is. Uh, David, you know what vertigo is. Imagine that happening in the soul. We're just all mixed up. Um, let's go to point number two. Doubt also needs evidence. Doubt pursues truth. Aren't you glad that Galileo questioned the earth being flat? Okay, Everybody else assumed it was flat, but he was like, you know what? It doesn't make sense to me. And he pushed through that. Um, how about pilots who are grateful for Chuck, Chuck Yeager, who pushed through the sound barrier? Chuck Yeager proved it's no barrier at all. You can break through it. Um, I'm glad for Thomas, who, for me, who struggles with doubt at times, he says it's okay. It's a right to search, to seek, to look. Um, the other disciples told him in verse 25 of John 20, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Put yourself in Thomas's place. Back when Jesus was talking about heading to Jerusalem, again, remember he chimes in, we shouldn't go. It's too dangerous. Jesus could die, and we as the disciples could die as well. Now that prediction had come true. I think probably Thomas is just upset. He's angry. Why didn't they listen to me? Jesus didn't have to die. It didn't have to end this way. Um, people who are thinkers can sometimes be skeptical or uh, we've got a game called the worst case scenario game. 
I love that game. That may tell you something about me, okay? But we need people who are thinking about the worst case scenario. They're prepared. It's called having a contingency plan. That's wisdom. There's nothing wrong with that. And to me, that's who Thomas was of the disciples. He was the contingency planner. Uh, he was the one who thought about the worst case. What can happen? How do we respond to that? Uh, skeptics, you know, they draw comfort from these four words. I told you so. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I guess not. Um, thank you, Ashley. So Thomas gets the word from the overjoyed apostles. He was here. You missed it. And what does Thomas do? Give me a break. You guys must have been dreaming. There is no possibility. The only way I will believe is if I see it with my own eyes and touch him with my own hands. I love the honesty of Thomas. He insists on seeing the evidence for himself. By the way, that's the skeptic's creed. I'll believe it when I see it. Point number three, doubt ultimately, if we keep seeking, will draw us to Christ. The scene is the same, but it's eight days later. The apostles are behind closed doors again, but Thomas is there this time, and Jesus shows up. One of the things I appreciate about Thomas is even in his doubting, he didn't break fellowship with his friends. Do you notice that? Even those eight days where he didn't believe them, and I don't know about you, but if my best friend didn't believe me about something like this, it might cause a little rift in our relationship. But that doesn't happen with the apostles. They're like, just keep coming. Keep hanging out with us. He's going to come back. He's going to show up. Don't know when. And then he does. And oh, what a moment that must have been. Um, a week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. What a moment that must have been for Thomas. Disciples were correct. Jesus is alive. Point number four, doubt grows our faith. Uh, just seeing Jesus wasn't enough. Let's read on. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand if you want to put it into my side. Here you go. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus knew those words that Thomas had said earlier. And he, Jesus gives Thomas what he needs. Don't you love that about Jesus? He is so patient with us. He doesn't get on Thomas's case. He just shows up. says, Thomas, here I am. God is able to handle questions that trouble you. But you first have got to be honest about your doubts. Don't keep doubt in the closet. Get it out where it can help you seek and find. And I would encourage you to seek out godly friends to help you with your doubts. I have my list of spiritual mentors over the years that I've gone to. Um, if you could have been in my office here at Arlington a number of times when I picked the phone up and I've dialed when I've been in a scripture that has confused me. Hey, give me your thoughts on this. Man, it helps. It, and there's been times, honestly, when some of my, my spiritual mentors have told me, you know, Mark, I don't know. I'm not sure the answer to that. Let's just both keep studying and seeking. That's the attitude that we want to have. Um, point five, doubt defines our faith. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. What a moment. This shows the dramatic, transforming power of the resurrection in someone's life. As one person said, when a question mark gets straightened out, guess what you have? An exclamation point. Okay? Those questions that we have, just keep, keep asking, but one day it's going to be an exclamation point, like we see here in John 20, 28. Let me give you some encouragement on handle, how to handle doubts. Number one, be honest. Be honest. Admit that there's something inside of you that's struggling. Number two, find out what's causing your doubt and deal with it. 
Are you having issues with the historical validity of Jesus? Well, there are resources out there available to help. Are you struggling with the problem of evil? Are you struggling with the question of why bad things happen to good people? Or maybe can you trust the Bible? Great minds have wrestled with these questions. And there are lots of resources I can point you to. Why? Because I have wrestled with those questions and I have purchased those resources. I have called my mentors and said, what can I read? Give me something. Um, so articulate what you doubt and why you doubt. What brought this doubt on? Number three, take your doubts directly to God. God is not going to be offended, I promise. Was God offended in the Psalms when David over and over again was struggling with why this is happening to him? Why are my enemies prevailing? Uh, why is Saul chasing after me, wanting to kill me? Why, why, why? Uh, consider the case of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. Quickly, I want to take you there. Another powerful passage. Um, Gideon, of course, being a... Um, of the smallest tribe of Benjamin, and God is asking him to um, lead this nation against the Midianites who are oppressing Israel. Uh, Judges 6, verse 12 and 13. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak um, in Ophrah, that's verse 11, that belonged to Joash the Abzerite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <clears throat> Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now, if the angel of the Lord appeared to me, I would like to think that I would be on my face. Oh my goodness, this is unbelievable. Our deliverer has come. You know, God is with us. But what does Gideon do? Pardon me? Excuse me? You know, what are you doing? You're supposed to be this great God. I remember hearing stories from my grandparents and my great-grandparents about all the things that you did, and this is what we get? Again, it's okay to ask why. Gideon is struggling. He's doubting. Next, God shows up in the, in the story, if you read on. We find out that it is the Lord, capitalized Yahweh, who now says, I'm real, and I'm here. And I'm with you, and you are going to deliver this people. And I, I love the story of Gideon. It is just so powerful. I wish we had time to go through it. One final thought. We need to remember that something, some, we need to remember something important when it comes to dealing with doubt. There are some things that you will never get the answer to. And I know some of you don't like hearing that. Because we are rational beings. God made us that way. God wants us, I believe, to seek, to find truth. But there are some things that remain mysterious. I don't have the questions to them. Can you be okay with that? Uh, number one, accept your limited knowledge. Be willing to accept it. The older I get, the more I realize how out of touch I am with modern day technology. I feel like a cassette in a digital world. And if you don't know what a cassette is, then I just made my point. And you guys probably don't even know. Um, do you know what I'm saying? I mean, stuff is changing so quickly. Um, the advances in science. Um, you know, we're likely going to go to Mars, folks, in the next 10 to 20 years. I mean, they're working towards that. That is amazing. There are some things I just don't understand, but in the face of my limitations and in the face of your limitations, we can come before God and say, Lord, I recognize my limited knowledge, so help me be all right with not having all the answers. Lord, help me with that. Let what you have revealed be enough. Number two, accept the limitations of the Bible. You might go, what? 
limitations of the Bible, <laughs> don't misread what I wrote there. I believe the Bible is fully inspired. It's the authoritative word of God. It is God's love letter to us, and he's revealed everything we need to know. But the Bible doesn't tell us everything. There are some things it's silent on. Back to Genesis, the creation of the world. I wish there was more detail, but we're not given it. We're given this beautiful poetic poem that builds upon itself in chapter 1 and 2 that God did it. But how he exactly did it, there are people debating that. Old earth, new earth, theistic evolution versus this or that. There was a day and time when I maybe got into that discussion, but anymore I don't even care. Because to me, God did it. And that's enough. I can believe that. I can take that. Um, number three. Actually, I almost forgot a very important verse there. Um, Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Guys, that's a great verse when we don't have the answer to something. I need to be able to say, all right, God, you have entrusted to me all that I really need to know that I can pass on to others. Point three, adjust to the amazing discoveries of the universe. There's a time, as I mentioned before, when people thought the earth was flat. People thought the solar system revolved around the earth. We didn't understand germ theory, nor the vastness of the universe, and how it is continuing to expand as we speak. It's un unbelievable, it's amazing. The more we study and learn about the world, the more complexity we discover. You know, my great-grandparents didn't know anything about molecules and atoms. Think about how far we have come. Um, consider the Hubble telescope. Here into is only a slice, a small fraction of the known universe. It's amazing. Whether it be the microscopic world that we can go in on, zoom in on, or if it's the telescopic world, it's incredible. Our minds are too small to even comprehend it. In fact, that's exactly what God said to Job. Remember Job, we began there this morning with all of those questions. What does God say in the end? Does he answer all the questions? Not one of them. What he does to Job is he takes him on a tour of the creation. Look at my world. Look at the animals I've created. I've done all of that. Trust me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Listen to what Paul wrote about the vast wisdom of God in Romans 11, 33 through 36. Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Isaiah writes something similar. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. In the end, I pray that we will all be like Thomas, who in the midst of his doubt and questions was able to declare, my Lord and my God. Amen. At this time, we're going to stand and we're going to sing the last two verses to Thomas' song where that declaration is actually made. And then after that, Danny's going to come up and he's going to walk us through quickly our annual meeting that we are required to do. Uh, so let's stand. Let's encourage each other as we sing. Holy presence, holy face, a vision filling time and space. If your nearness makes my spirit race.
Could this be part of the plan? I see the wounds that caused the cry from heaven, ocean, earth, and sky. When people watched their Savior die, could this be part of the plan? Reaching out to hold your hand and touch the scar. As Mark mentioned, we're required by law, uh, the laws of the state of Tennessee, to, uh, to hold a, uh, a corporate meeting of the Arlington Church of Christ <clears throat> Corporation uh, just to fulfill uh, the laws. So uh, I've checked, and between uh, our, audience, our audience here, we have about 45, uh, and we have about 32 uh, online between the two services, uh, or the two uh, YouTube and Facebook. <clears throat> so uh, I think I can call to order the annual meeting of the Arlington Church of Christ, Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, is now called to order. Let it be noted that a quorum is present um, by the combined online and in person. Um, as far as old business, uh, the annual meeting for 2020 was held on February 9th, uh, 2020 at 1130 a.m. <clears throat> 11 a.m. in the auditorium of the Arlington Church of Christ. A quorum was present uh, at that meeting. Uh, the highlights for the year of 2019 were reviewed <clears throat> with the new budget for 2020 approved at $4,566 uh, per week. <clears throat> God blessed us and our members greatly through a pandemic uh, that, we're, that we are still feeling the effects of. <clears throat> and by his grace, uh, we were able to meet our budget for 2020. We praise God and give him uh, the glory uh, for our blessings. Excuse my voice. <clears throat> a summary uh, of some of the highlights uh, for what was 2020 uh, that a lot of people would probably rather forget. Um, but due to the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we were under a mandate to not, to not meet in person for much of 2020 after uh, the month of March. Uh, but we had a number of people who stepped up uh, to help make our services available for, lives, <clears throat> for live streaming on both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, this was no small feat. And we have uh, Jason McDougall, Alan Rawlings, and Jacob Shannon to thank for their, their tireless efforts making our services available each week. Uh, also, Alan Groves and a group of volunteer singers uh, that always were up here, uh, met uh, safely um, and gathered to make the singing uh, online both rich. Uh, and we want to thank uh, all of those volunteers as well. I think they all deserve a hand for the tremendous amount of work that they put into um, what, they, what they've done. <clears throat> Um, the financial situation at Arlington remained healthy and strong even through a very trying year. On top of the funding required to meet our budget, <clears throat> we also had a number of benevolent opportunities uh, that, that arose and that were met 
uh, because of your faithful giving. Uh, it is important that you know uh, how your money is used to meet needs and serve others. Uh, the following are just a few of the opportunities that we were able to meet. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, we had two members that we assisted uh, financially. We had one member that we paid medical bills for, another member uh, for rent and phone. Uh, we paid for four hotel rooms for uh, homeless individuals, bought one bus ticket, collaborated uh, and helped pay for a, a wheelchair ramp. Um, we purchased a lift uh, to go on a wheelchair. Um, and for Hope Central, we had a special contribution for a funeral and special donations to purchase books uh, for the kids at Christmas. And, and there were many other needs that were met in various ways. And, and again, that was due to your, uh, your faithful giving. Um, as far as uh, any other old business, uh, is there any other old business that anyone has that we need to, uh, need to note? If not, we'll move to new business. I'm sorry, I, I don't do this justice like Tom Drennan. And if, and, if, and if Bud were in the auditorium, I'd go ahead and read the bylaws for him just because he likes it so much. <clears throat> What's that, David? Yeah, go get him. Um, as far as new business, uh, first item of new business is the 2021 budget. Uh, on behalf of the elders, I'd like to present the 2021 budget at $4,131 a week. Uh, this is a decrease from the previous year, due in part to some cost-saving measures uh, that were completed on our facilities in, in 2020, <clears throat> and also a reduction in the cost of some of the services uh, that we use. <clears throat> As far as our outlook, we continue to pray for growth, uh, both physically and spiritually, this new year. Our continued focus will be on helping, all, helping us all become more missional and intentional in loving God and loving others. We don't know what the gatherings are going to look like in the coming year as far as Winterfest or Vacation Bible School or Sanctuary or Hillbrook, uh, and, and as well as other events. Uh, we will just simply have to adapt uh, as we need to, as, as we have been doing. Um, you know, Jesus had a way in scripture of, of throwing out impediments that stood in the way of what was really important, which was connection and relationship with God and, and others. Uh, and we need to think out of the box about how we can accomplish his mission this year, because it looks very different this year and, and this past year uh, than we've ever seen. So we need to think out of the box uh, in, in ways that we can reach uh, those around us and of course uh, fulfill that, uh, uh, his mission. Uh, one of those accomplishments has been through our Zoom Bible study, <clears throat> our Zoom Bible study events. Uh, this is a tool uh, that's brought those of us uh, who've taken advantage of it a way to interact and stay involved in one another's lives and draw closer to God uh, in the process. We've been challenged in our interpretation and application of scripture, uh, and we will continue to explore ways uh, to use this tool. Uh, we will continue to maintain our online presence and enhance or transform those resources uh, to reach well beyond these physical doors, uh, taking advantage of opportunities that did not even exist for Arlington at this time last year. When you look at what we are uh, uh, able to do now as far as, as getting uh, online and getting uh, on YouTube and Facebook groups. Um, we have a much greater reach, I think, than we realize. Uh, so we need to obviously uh, take advantage of that uh, beyond these physical doors. Um, so one format change that, we, that we've made uh, is on our Facebook group. We'll, we'll no longer post uh, daily messages from the elders. Uh, we felt like that season uh, had come to a close uh, to where they're not needed daily. However, Mark will continue uh, to provide his Monday uh, devotionals, and the other el elders will rotate in uh, to help at different times. And we plan to have opportunities to serve, uh, both for young and old alike, so stay tuned uh, for those. There are copies in the foyer uh, that have the 2020 actual spending versus what was uh, budgeted. 
and then on the other side of that is the 2021 budget that we introduced today for your review. Um, and there's also a copy, uh, there'll be a copy posted on the bulletin board. Uh, is there any other new business uh, that we have at this time? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of, pardon me? Um, I was asked if we could, uh, if we could talk about Tommy's role uh, in the upcoming year. Um, Tommy, do you, would, would you like to say something about that? This will be our final point, uh, and then we'll, uh, oh, okay, well, either one. He was just, I saw him, if he wouldn't mind. If you'll just quickly just tell, you know, kind of the, the changes that we're looking at. Thank you, man. <clears throat> Sorry, I couldn't think on my feet. Right <laughs> Good morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, I'll be quick. Um, basically, a uh, lot of changes, some of them, quite frankly, unexpected, um, but completely trust in the Lord and that he's in charge and know what he's doing, even when something comes that's unexpected. Uh, first of all, uh, Emerald uh, decided to pull their program out. Nothing acrimonious, nothing that had anything to do with being upset. They're, they're following a new model uh, in the work that they're doing across the city. And basically, if you're familiar with Emerald at all, you'll see less and less programs inside church buildings. And you'll see central locations that they have. And so, uh, anyway, beginning the first of the year, um, the, the uh, Emerald program itself uh, came out of the church building. And Hannah Vaughn, which we're very grateful for her work here for two years, uh, almost two years, uh, was mo assigned to a new place in Emerald's ministry. Um, with Hope Central restarting the program at the Woodbine House, uh, the Blue House, uh, Miss Vita uh, Sprinkle coming out of retirement and coming back and restarting the ministry at the Blue House, um, the, it, it makes a lot of sense for the elementary, the middle school programs to be in that location where Hope Central began. Um, and the way that I look at it and the way that I uh, approach it is that for about eight or nine years, I've been working with a lot of kids that I started with at elementary kids and now they're in high school. Um, we're about two years away from some of those kids graduating from high school. And one of the things that I can see in working with these kids for this long is that we're gonna need to be thinking about, praying about, what does it look like to help them transition into adulthood? What it, what one, of the, one of the places that, um, that studies say and experience says when you're there is that the most difficult time for these young people that have been through uh, difficult situations, been through poverty, is that time at the end of high school, what do I do now? You know, and that's a dangerous time for them. And so um, I'm focusing on those high school kids. Uh, we've got some great people. Troy Callie, who worked with us here for the past two years, has been hired to work with the elementary and the middle school at Hope Central, and he and his wife do a fantastic job. Uh, I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you that I miss all the elementary and middle school stuff, okay? I'm, I'm turned 57 this week, and, um, and I'm, I'm frankly okay to be out of elementary camp and all those kinds of things, no lie. Um, but we've got a group of high school kids. Last Saturday, I had a group of 12 high school kids here working, helping to set up the building, reset up classrooms, clean, do all kinds of things, and they did a great job. And so we're going to be focused on not only on now, how can we connect them and serve them and help them, but we're also looking at some things in the future coming up about how can we best help them transition into adulthood, whether that be uh, vocational school, college, whether that be job, career training, those kinds of things. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at this year, uh, obviously supporting and cheering on and, and, and um, hoping for the success of the Woodbine work as well. Uh, but that's where that is, is that good? Yeah. 
Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Tommy, and uh, we we just continue to look forward to you know the ways that we can meet meet needs of those uh, of those children. Any other new business that we have? Uh, if no other new business, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Uh, do I hear a second? So our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, and have a great day. <laughs>